Thank you, Gilbert. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having come. <laughs> now, uh, I shall not repeat or even summarize what I said yesterday because I guess uh, all of you or most of you have been have attended it. I'm entering the second chapter of this uh, 60 years history, um, which is the uh, the rise and the triumph for a short period of so-called neoliberalism. So-called neoliberalism, because I think that the uh, qualifying the system neoliberal is absolutely meaningless, and it is uh, uh, it is uh, <clears throat> an ideological uh, qualification, just as uh, considering, for instance, Soviet Union as communist. Uh, <clears throat> one has to to uh, uh, make uh, clear what are the real uh, fundamental important characteristic of that so-called neoliberal, just as one had to uh, qualify, to look at the, re the reality behind the word communist, huh? uh, <clears throat> we, we, without trying to uh, a priori qualify good or bad, or socialist or capitalist, which are very general, embracing uh, a lot of things which are uh, which could be uh, quite different and uh, no less important. So, uh, but um, how it uh, came out, um, how and 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 uh, and, uh, and what it has uh, uh, produced. Um, that is the second period, a relatively short period, I would say, of uh, 25 years to put dates from 75 to 2000. Uh, or say to the first uh, announcement of the deepening of the crisis with the financial crisis of uh, Southeast Asia, Mexico, and uh, Russia towards the end of the 90s. <clears throat> now, um, without uh, arrogance, I would say that André Gunder Frank and myself, so I'm not alone, huh? <clears throat> we, uh, we were... Uh, feeling that change quite early. Because in Rome, uh, invited by Manifesto, it was exactly in 78, uh, we uh, produced a short book uh, with the title, uh, Let Us Not Wait, 1984, reference to Orwell, 1984. Huh? Um, that is um, looking at uh, the capitalist system as entering a long crisis, a long crisis. This is what we wrote, uh, which has started in 71 was the announcement with abandoning the gold standard by the US and the US saying arrogantly to Europe, the dollar is our money and it is your problem, just as the, recently the, the governor of the Central Bank of China has said the yuan is our money, it is your problem. <laughs> um, but let's say as of 73 with the uh, um, uh, flexible rates of exchange more or less generalized and of uh, 75 very clearly the uh, uh, rates of growth uh, of accumulation therefore moving to half of what they have been on the average for the uh, previous 25 or 30 years and never recovered since. So the long crisis did not start with the uh, uh, with 2008. It started in seven, in the 70s, exactly, exactly a century after the first long uh, crisis. Now um, we imagined, uh, André Gunder Frank and I, that uh, the response to that uh, long crisis starting. Nobody. The, the the language of conventional economics is always the same: recession things of that kind, uh, uh, conjunctural re recession, uh, the, the response would be uh, intensifying the concentration and centralization of capital, intensifying the subordination of the peripheries through massive transfer of uh, center of gravity of uh, industries, but controlled industries through the five, what I called, I wrote it at that time, the five monopolies, new monopolies, that is the control of technologies, the control of the access to natural resource, the control of uh, communication, the control of the uh, 
integrate a new monetary and financial system with the flexible rates of exchange, uh, uh, etc., and the control of uh, armament, of mass, of mass destruction, uh, uh, of course. Uh. <clears throat> now, and uh, that this would lead to uh, an attempt to control the new coming wave of industrialization of, uh, if not the peripheries, all of them, at least uh, quite a uh, good number of powerful new centers emerging. And, um, and we, we called it uh, Model A and Model B, theoreticals. Model A uh, with uh, the perfect control of that transfer, subcontracting, and, uh, and, and control through the five monopolies. And that would lead also to a deep crisis in the center that is a massive uh, and growing unemployment and, uh, and st relative stagnation of income. Uh, and B would be uh, uh, the other extreme that the five, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, <coughs> capacity of the emerging countries uh, to get rid of that control of the five monopolies. And then what is going to come out of that? A new wave of capitalism with center of gravity moving uh, to other regions than historical imperialism, or a, state, a step on the long road to socialism. That book was, you can read it, <laughs> uh, was, was not, not not considered at all in this time. I think because it was in advance for its time. Eh? But if we say today, look at what is happening, look at the uh, stagnation in the centers, look at uh, the uh, transfer of center of gravity of industrialization, look at the struggle between emerging and, 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 and not emerging countries which are uh, controlled and countries which uh, fight not to be controlled, we are not very far from the reality of today. Um, so that was, that was uh, uh, the early views. Uh, in, I am a stubborn person, so I, I was sticking to my, my hour, because André Gunda Frank was no less than me in that uh, respect. We had long, long discussions with the Italians at that time of manifesto, which were uh, very uh, innovative and open, uh, and were perhaps the only one, only people among the European communists who dared thinking in that, in that way. Uh, that is globally and in a revolution, revolutionary way. Now, um, what, therefore being stubborn, I, what, what is the new wave of, uh, of centralization of capital which is coming? Uh, and then gradually, I, I wouldn't say immediately, I came to the following, uh, if not hypothesis perhaps, but I consider it more than a hypothesis. I, I think it's a reality, even if we would need far more uh, ob observation research uh, to make it uh, more precise uh, and, and, and perhaps to introduce a lot of nuances. Huh? as usual, ne needed. But still, um, that is a, in a short period between 75 and 90, 15 years, which coincide with Thatcherism and Reagan. Eh? But uh, it, that is not pure chance, of course. Eh? It's uh, logic. Uh, but which are not due to uh, Thatcher and, uh, and Reagan, uh, but to the internal logic of monopoly capital reacting to the crisis. Centralization of what? Um, in, during those 15 years, and that has been observed by a lot of uh, economists, uh, merging uh, companies and so on, uh, uh, all sorts of things of that kind, the rise of pension funds, which existed before, huh, um, as, as uh, enormous provider of uh, finance, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, my point is that what has happened is a centralization of the control of capital. And I am I'm, I'm I'm, uh, uh, <clears throat> insisting on that. Not of the property of capital, of the control 
of capital. And I, I give the obvious example of pension funds, which juridically are the property of the millions of uh, workers, but which de facto is the property of uh, the financial uh, capital which manage it. Hmm? Uh, centralization of, of the um, control of capital. And I submit that this has led in a short period to a qualitative change uh, in monopoly capital. Now, I discussed that basically with the team uh, uh, of monthly review, uh, particularly Paul Sweezy and Harry Bagdoff, before they died, and then with uh, uh, John Foster. But uh, uh, they also were among the few people at that time, uh, the few Marxists say, and nobody else uh, was interested in that question, uh, um, of this uh, uh, new level, uh, higher level of centralization of control of capital. Now, I formulated it uh, um, maybe 10 years or 15 years later by qualifying it uh, and then I, I shall qualify the, 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 the system uh, as, um, <clears throat> as um, uh, generalized, globalized, financialized monopoly capital. It's a little long, but that is the reality in my opinion, not neoliberalism, which is the uh, very superficial uh, naming. Um, and ought, we ought to, uh, therefore, uh, specify what are the characteristics of each of those qualities, generalized, what I mean by that, etc. Hmm? Now, generalized in the sense that, of course, monopolies or oligopolies existed before, since uh, one century, uh, and were important, perhaps even were decisive in the, uh, in the designing of uh, economic policies of major imperialist countries, but there was a vast area of economic activities, capitalist ac economic activities, which were relatively, or to various degrees, autonomous or independent from monopolies. Hmm? Um, and uh, there was a, a little interconnection between the monopolies in the various areas. For instance, car industry, where monopolies, or I don't know, another uh, sector. Uh, very few uh, interaction, except through the generalized market, of course. Eh? But that is superficial. Um, uh, to a system in which, uh, in which there is almost no more Perhaps I am exaggerating a little, but not much, I think. No more autonomous activity. That is, all production activities of uh, goods and services uh, are completely controlled by uh, this centralized monopoly capital. This, this is why it is generalized, in the sense that it, command, it, it controls the whole productive system the whole productive system is controlled by them. Uh, upstream and downstream, allowing, uh, 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 um, um, creating a new status for the apparently autonomous activities of de facto subcontractors. In many cases, e even the jury, uh, through contracts with monopolies, but de facto, if they remain uh, apparently uh, independent, and it is the so-called market, which never existed as such we, without being qualified pre more precisely, which uh, decides. That is upstream, the monopolies, and you take a very good example, which is the uh, agricultural, uh, modern agriculture, uh, uh, family farming uh, in the Western countries, in the US, in Canada, in Western Europe. Um, Japan is a little different, but uh, 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 there are always differences from one place to another, but these are secondary, uh, <clears throat> which, uh, which were uh, relatively independent uh, at the previous stage, even with monopolies, um, in the sense that uh, uh, the so-called market 
decided of the prices of their product, which was uh, producing, allowing an income for the farmers, family farmers, which was, uh, which was uh, at least equal to the uh, average uh, uh, income, in that case, uh, wage of uh, qualified uh, labor, hmm? say. Um, that has disappeared because it's controlled upstream by monopolies who are providing the credit, who are providing the inputs, Monsanto, and so on, and downstream by the monopolies which are controlling the uh, supermarkets uh, chain of distribution and so on. And that upstream and downstream control means that the uh, uh, value and surplus value which is created in uh, modern capitalist farmer uh, agriculture, uh, family agriculture, if you call it so, uh, is completely pumped out and is, is, is the source of a rent, not a profit, a monopoly rent upstream and, down, and downstream. To the extent that uh, the, at those prices, the income of farmers would be zero, and even in some cases perhaps uh, negative or very small, and that uh, it is compensated by subsidies of the state, which means the taxpayer uh, finance the super profit which, is, which are the monopoly rents. That is the system. Uh, it's not market. Huh? So the blah blah about transparency of competition, the market is uh, revealing the true prices and so on is uh, a pure uh, imaginary ideological blah blah which has nothing to do with how the system is uh, operating actually. So that is what I mean by generalized. And you can expand that to uh, uh, almost all services, including uh, health, and uh, to the extent that it is uh, private or semi-private and so on, you can extend it to uh, uh, at also a global level through what ap appears as international trade on uh, 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 major commodities. You can extend it, and you will see that um, decentralization of uh, control is enormous, gigantic. Now, <clears throat> that is one of the content of this so-called neoliberalism. It's the major one, hmm? because it is determinant for the rest. Then the second point is globalized. Globalized is, is nothing new. Globalization has started with capitalism. Um, well, André Gunder Frank even saying it started 5,000 years before. I disagree with that, because it is uh, uh, disregarding the qualitative meaning of uh, fundamental modes of production, say, at least. But anyway, that's not the point. And, um, uh, but what new pattern of globalization? And this new globalization, I'm uh, precisely relating it to the generalized monopoly capital by the fact that it is trying to operate by strategies, uh, systematic, uh, economic and political strategies to support them uh, through the five uh, advantages, if we don't call them monopolies. That is the control of the access to natural resource. Again, not necessarily the property. Uh, the oil can be uh, owned by a, formally by a national company uh, of the producer country. Um, that's of no importance. Uh, to the extent that the access is meant that you are not allowed not to exploit it and not to export it. Huh? Uh, in order to, uh, and, and that scramble, I mean, for the uh, control of access of natural resources is fundamental. Well, perhaps it's not new because it has been important before also, but it's fundamental in the new uh, geopolitics. Um, second is the control over on, on, uh, on technologies, particularly new technologies, not uh, producing bicycles, but new technologies, uh, vanguard technologies, particularly the, uh, in, uh, the um, digital, but not only that, eh? also the uh, nuclear, whether we like it or not, also the uh, um, space, also, etc., etc. Uh, by overprotection, overprotection 
of so-called industrial property by uh, WTO. Hmm? Uh, <clears throat> the control of, uh, that is, uh, uh, medias and uh, communications and therefore information and, uh, and, and shape, uh, shaping, shaping the uh, uh, mentality of people, etc., etc., uh, the control, and I, this is an important point to which I will come back tomorrow, uh, this afternoon, I mean, uh, the control of the integrated financial and monetary system, because that means the control of mass capital. I mean, uh, uh, the access to mass, uh, even if you, uh, poor chap, wants to... Uh, uh, Fire? Hmm? Ah, it's, it's a test. Okay, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, the control, uh, e e even if you have to borrow some money to buy uh, a, an apartment, uh, you are not the, uh, you have not access. It's not you who have access to the capital market. Uh, it's uh, the bank through which uh, uh, you operate, uh, which means that the uh, capital mar uh, access to capital market for uh, is exclusive for those monopolies, huh? uh, <clears throat> um, and um, and that is operating at the global level. But I'll come to this point because it is very central in the conflict and contradiction of that system. Now, and uh, that leads to the financialization, in the sense that, but this is the subject of this. Uh, uh, no, it's the subject of this this morning, not this afternoon. It leads to well, what it has led to very fast. Exactly what we wrote, André Gunder Frank and I, in 78. Uh, that is uh, relative stagnation, uh, that is low rates of growth in the centers, accelerated rates of growth in the peripheries, emerging markets, not nations or countries. Eh? But I'll come to that later, and um, and uh, along with uh, uh, so-called recession, which is not a recession, um, low rates of, of growth, uh, growing unemployment, etc., and that is a internal imbalance. The uh, uh, very different from the imbalance which Keynes had uh, uh, analyzed, which was the reality of his time in the 30s between the uh, not global in the sense of world, but the overall uh, supply and demand, and very different from it, but of the same nature, say, uh, an imbalance. That imbalance, along with the pumping of the value and surplus value by monopoly rent, is the objective basis for growing fast uh, inequality. You know the figures, they have been provided particularly for the US, but they exist everywhere that the first, uh, I, I don't remember if it were the 5% wealthier or the 10%, but that's not important, which controlled 7% of the income, 15% uh, of the income in 20s had gone down to 7 to half of it uh, towards the 50s and has moved up back to 15%, the, to the double, within uh, a couple of uh, uh, two decades. Huh? So gigantic and fast uh, growing uh, inequality uh, in, uh, in income and wealth, which, which means a, 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 a spiral uh, to, to the bottom, because this is not correcting the imbalance, but, uh, uh, but making the imbalance uh, um, more and more acute. Again, opposite to the blah blah on the market, that the tendency of the market is to a tendency to tend towards equilibrium of supply and demand. No, the market is creating growing disequilibrium and not uh, because the market is shaped by the strategies of monopoly. It's not the market per se. The market of which the World Bank, IMF, uh, etc., and the others are speaking it, it does not exist. Huh? It's uh, an imaginary system, not a not, uh, not uh, capitalism. Um, and and, and uh, as, as Marx has shown, and he was 
He is the uh, only one who has shown it. The, uh, uh, the system moves from disequilibrium to disequilibrium without no tendency to tend to towards an equilibrium. Now, the two only anti-Marxists who try to prove the opposite seriously, not the ideological blah, blah, huh? uh, deciding a priori that the market is not that, uh, were uh, Valras in the 19th century and, uh, uh, and, uh, and um, Srafa in the 20th. It's not a pure chance that none of them was, was Anglo-Saxon. Both of them, one was uh, Franco-Swiss and the other was Italo, even if he, he were living in, in Britain. Um, um, that attempt to prove that the market would tend to that, they failed. Uh, they were honest enough, uh, contrary to the neo, to the conventional economists, to recognize it. Huh? <clears throat> anyway, uh, I think I said it yesterday. Uh, uh, if you take the case of Srafa, production of commodities by commodities, it's nonsense, huh? because you can put on the, on the ground all the ingredients for production, including the uh, wage goods, uh, and leave them on the ground, nothing will happen except that they would get wasted by time, uh, if not introducing labor. This production of commodities with commodities by labor and not by commodities. Uh, <clears throat> that is the fundamental of the understanding of the so-called market as opposite, I'm not speaking of planning, eh, as opposite to really existing relations of production, uh, commanding, and shaping the so-called, the apparent, the surface, the top of the iceberg, which appears as the market. Now, that system, um, but this is, will, I will develop more this afternoon, uh, is not, I never considered it, I personally never considered it as sustainable. But as a transition uh, after the, um, uh, resulting of the erosion of the uh, uh, previous system or systems, which I mentioned it yesterday, uh, the three systems of uh, social democracy in the West, uh, of uh, really existing socialisms in the East, uh, Soviet and, and, and Chinese, of national popular uh, systems with all their variation in the, in the South, uh, which uh, eroded and broke down mm, uh, at the same time and, 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 and together. I mean, the uh, stupidity of the social democrats was that to think that the defeat of the communists would be their, their victory. It meant the defeat of the cousins and then of themselves a little uh, uh, quickly after. <laughs> Uh, that their strength was associated with the strength of the uh, alternative model, if we call it so, uh, or alternative force or other force uh, uh, questioning capitalism or questioning the control of capital, uh, which was um, the really existing socialism. And then, um, and uh, we can call it their suicide, moving from social democracy to social liberalism, and disappearing as such, huh? uh, making that, and, and uh, making no no difference between uh, left and right, uh, uh, which had a meaning before, and the uh, Soviet uh, relatively brutal breakdown, but after a long decline during the 80s. I mean the uh, Gorbachev uh, uh, time, uh, and um, and the uh, move after. Uh, the death of, of Mao through Deng Xiaoping to uh, a new vision or a new strategy for, um, for China and the gradual, and there it took different forms for the South. In some cases, it was uh, really a coup d'etat and the return to uh, neo-colonial, if we call it so, uh, regime. In other cases, particularly with, the, with respect to the Arab countries, and that is important to understand what is happening now, that the same ruling class, which had been national popular, uh, in order to remain in apparent power, in, <coughs> uh, uh, moved, they decided themselves to move to, or they accepted to move to neoliberalism, to submission, 
uh, in order to remain in power, that was the Infitah of the Arab countries, which was led by the, uh, uh, those who inherited uh, Nasserism or Boumedien or uh, the, the old Ba'ath of Syria and, uh, and uh, Iraq, um, and, um, and therefore created the um, conditions for what happened later, the explosion or the, the uh, popular uh, <coughs> revolts. Eh? Um, it, mm, so it took a, a number of, of forms. That is very important to look into, of course, and I have, don't have time here. I, I just mentioned the rough uh, lines, um, but uh, case by case. Eh? But we have to have some uh, overall vision. Now, that is, um, uh, that, that, that is the meaning of uh, uh, financialization, because um, due to this uh, spiral and growing imbalance, uh, the only alternative uh, uh, investment, since investment cannot go in the widening and deepening of the productive system, in spite of its being to various degrees associated with the uh, higher growth in the peripheries, uh, in sub-peripheries, uh, which is partly an outlet for investment, but very small if you look at the figures as compared to uh, the uh, moving out into uh, financial investments that is precisely speculation uh, made possible by the uh, flexible rates of ex exchange made possible by the so-called independence of the central bank, which is meaningless, uh, empty of uh, any meaning, uh, which uh, we, we, uh, all that uh, with the future markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now there are people who are um, saying that it is the invention of those techniques which have made it possible. My tendency is to say the opposite. Uh, something is invented when it is useful, when it has to be invented, particularly in areas such as uh, 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 credit uh, uh, formulas, says, and, and so on. Uh, the Venetians had invented things which were useful in their time, while the modern people are no less clever, they invent what is needed. Uh, Foster has shown, I think, and he's one of the few, who has shown that this is, is bound to move from bubble to bubble. This is why after the uh, subprime, we had the bubble of uh, speculation on commodities, on food, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, fundamental minerals, copper. You know, if you look at the figures, it, it, it can be, the price can be so-called market multiplied by three within uh, a few weeks um, and stand at high level for some time before moving back down, a little down, and so chaotic, chaotic. But this chaos is not the chaos produced by the so-called market. It's the chaos produced by the uh, internal contradiction of the strategies uh, developed by that centralized monopoly capital but that centralized monopoly capital, that generalized monopoly capital. Uh, it is its internal logic. Now, that also has enormous political consequences or uh, dimensions of political and social. One is the change of the pattern of the bourgeoisie. Now, throughout uh, history, one may say, and particularly throughout uh, European and North American history, of the 19th century and uh, half of the 20th century and, and more. And uh, the bourgeoisie, one, were uh, to be counted by millions and millions and tens of millions, eh? not thousands of hundreds of thousands. Second, they were, uh, um, they were um, embedded in uh, families, usually men. Uh, related to some place with the uh, owner of a factory here, of uh, uh, the, uh, bigger or smaller, but still, eh? and uh, with a political 
legitimacy, influence uh, in their place, etc. It was a concrete reality. Now we are moving towards Marx, and that was uh, what I discovered in the most recent reading, re-reading of Capital, um, considered as a tendency, but he was very optimistic that tendency uh, would, uh, uh, things would change before, of the rule of abstract capital. That is, who is the owner? It's a meaningless question. When you said in the 19th century, who is the owner of that factory, you could designate a person, a man, a house, a, uh, somewhere. Huh? Now, uh, abstract capital. But this abstract capital is managed by really a, uh, uh, I don't like the word plutocracy because it has been used by the fascists, uh, but it is the reality today, huh? by a handful, a handful of uh, people who decide. Now, that, um, that is a gigantic, gigantic change. Uh, I would say cultural, the good sense of the world, of the world, and political, of course. And this is also uh, the objective reason for uh, the disappearing of the meaning, of the historical meaning that it had of left and right within the bourgeois democracy uh, of the uh, previous stages, compelling capital and labor to come to historical compromises of one kind or another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's the end of it. Um, and um, the other aspect uh, of that uh, abstract is collective imperialism. I mentioned it, I think, yesterday, yeah? uh, answering one question, which was in advance, uh, because I, I, I had it in mind for today. That is um, the reverse of the relation between internal, let's call it national market, and global market. That is... Uh, uh, it, uh, competition, in a of sense, would not be market uh, meaning, uh, between uh, monopolies and uh, where, uh, where basically uh, developing, deploying at national level and the winner would be the one who would uh, penetrate the global market. Now it's reversed. It's the one who penetrates uh, and partly control or have access to uh, the global market, which turns to be also the winner at national level, if we call it so. Now, that is the objective basis for that collective imperialism of the triad, which was not the product of the Cold War and of political uh, alliance against the uh, Soviet Union and communism, but which is the product more important. That, that aspect did exist also, of course, huh? but it, it is, in my opinion, secondary, the main aspect was the change at the root of the uh, level of centralization of the control of capital. This is why, and I would uh, conclude that part of my presentation of this morning, I, have, I will still take uh, some five or 10 minutes, by what I think I said yesterday, because the question again was ahead of time. It's not what appears to be the so-called tyranny of the markets. No, it's the tyranny of that plutocracy. Uh, oligarchy, call it, eh? if you don't want to uh, say plutocracy, um, uh, which uh, is, are developing strategies which shape the markets. And therefore, it's their tyranny and not the tyranny of market per se. And the uh, uh, opposing uh, market and planning is a good way of escaping the real problems eh? and, 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 and uh, moving the debate to an abstract ideological uh, le uh, level instead of looking at uh, really existing market and really existing eventually planning, on the other hand. That is the question of the social historical content of, let's call them state capitalisms, plural, eh? not state capitalisms as a category per se. Now, that, that system has moved through, uh, has been, as, as I said, not sustainable, but uh, apparent glorious, glorious uh, victory, uh, which uh, the 
the glory of the victory was uh, exaggerated also because it coincided with the breakdown of the Soviet Union, 1990, say, um, a, opening a new era which uh, Giovanni Arrighi and myself qualified La Belle Époque because it was repeating exactly the nonsense which was said in the first Belle Époque, that is the uh, victory of, uh, uh, in response to the first long crisis of first age of monopoly capital, first age of globalization, first age of uh, financial uh, financialization. Uh, at, at the time it was called in French La Belle Époque. Huh? Uh, and, uh, it was also all the nonsense that you have read, we have read in the 90s about the end of history, about, the, this, about democracy, peace, and so on, uh, the dividend of peace because of the end of Cold War, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly the same was written in the 90s, uh, before World War I, <laughs> La Belle Époque. Huh? Uh, oh, curiously, almost uh, a century later, because it was between... Uh, uh, 1890, the 1890s, the uh, uh, rapprochement, the uh, la, la, uh, uh, um, uh, the name of this plane, uh, Le Concorde, uh, between the, the, the French and the British, uh, the uh, Franco-Russian alliance, etc., etc., and all that, exactly the same a century later. Now, uh, that Belle Époque, um, went on for 10 years, 20 years, very, very short period in history, uh, with uh, uh, exaggerating all the, re making worse and worse every day, all the uh, characteristics of that new pattern of generalized uh, monopoly capital. That is increasing inequalities, uh, not peace, but wars, uh, local, but important still, uh, starting exactly in 91 with the first or the second Gulf War, depending on how you qualify the Iraq-Iran war, um, the Kuwait war, say, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they, now, um, that created, uh, that was a, a, an era of uh, apparent, but I'll come this afternoon on more quali qualifying more this, apparent recolonization, recompradorization. Now, as I said, in accordance with the Mao type of analysis, not opposing the national bourgeoisie to the comprador bourgeoisie as two existing classes, but as two attitudes of the same class, hmm? or two tendencies, one winning more than the other, depending on conditions of the same class, that is, uh, uh, developing national strategies or accepting and submitting to comprador uh, uh, policies and strategies, uh, attitudes. Now, <clears throat> recompradorization, recolonization, etc. Now, uh, the first wave, and I'll come to that this afternoon, of uh, uh, moving to uh, trying to benefit from, uh, find a place in that globalization by uh, uh, growing, uh, by f uh, industrialization, export industrialization, uh, subcontracting in the weakest, in the most cases, and uh, trying to be not exclusively subcontracting, that is the Chinese uh, pattern, during the 90s was, was. Now, again, without, um, now, with respect to Africa, this is important with respect to Africa. It means that Africa is important, Africa is important because of its natural resources. The African peoples are not important. They are rather a, um, a superfluous, hmm? uh, which is the scandal of scandal. I mean, if, if a whole continent is superfluous, one should ask the question, is it not the system? which leads to that which is superfluous, which means that what is to be questioned is not African societies, but capitalism, uh, which condemned them to that. Now, I've said a word about uh, uh, whenever the ruling classes or the ruling power, and this is again Mao, the state, 
the state, meaning that those who have, if not the monopoly, who have the decisive position in uh, ruling the society, ruling the politics, ruling the state, uh, tend to uh, uh, establish themselves as a force. Double independence, he said Mao. Independence from their people and independence from the other uh, powers, external powers. Uh, double independence. As far as possible, independence from their own uh, people, including if they have been the product of a true uh, people's revolution, which is the case of uh, China at least, and, but also of others to various extent, um, to, to become independent of that and also independent, that is national, national in, from imperialism, that is an attempt to move out of precisely the five monopolies or the five advantages that I mentioned. Now, in that case, in that case, uh, the, um, the, uh, um, this ruling class become, uh, I call it a comprador state. Hmm? It's, uh, it could uh, look a, a little, uh, or a comprador state capitalism. Uh, and I think that that is my, how I qualify the Arab, uh, among others, uh, particularly the Arab systems uh, of, uh, for, for Egypt, Sadat and Mubarak, for uh, Algeria after Boumedien, uh, and the drift of the Saddam Hussein and Hafez al-Assad uh, in Iraq and Syria. Now, so, that, that is how I read the second chapter. Uh, I was asked in two, exactly in 2002, because I was writing that this system is unsustain, unsustainable at the time of where the fashion was, it's uh, capitalism forever, capitalism is a flexible system which can adjust to any change, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all this kind of literature, that it is not, and I, I wrote the financial side of it, it's, it's a Kyle's heel, and it will uh, start falling apart by and through what would, uh, would, will appear as financial crisis. I was laughed at. Huh? And uh, a provocative journalist asked me when, and I told him I don't have a crystal ball to tell you the day uh, <laughs> and the hour, perhaps. <laughs> but... Uh, Within ten, 10 years, we were in 2002. Huh? It happened in 2008. Hmm? Uh, so, and if it were not the subprime, it would have been something else. Huh? Uh, that is the accident, uh, takes always a concrete uh, uh, face, but it could be another one. So, I'll, um, I'll stop at that point in order not to move into the subject of this afternoon on the second coming rise of the South. Thank you. <laughs>